Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Smash or Pass with JB, hey. me Millie and Smash. Hello. So in today's episode we're going to be taking a look at Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Now this is episode two, so if you guys haven't seen episode one yet, we covered Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, we took a look at the plot and we really went into some of like the key theories of things that may have been bothering us since we very first watched this movie like 20 years ago. So we are going to do the same thing now for The Witch's Ghost. So for those of you that haven't seen this movie for a little while, I'm just going to go over the plot. So the gang meet famous horror writer Ben Ravencroft, who takes them to his hometown Oakhaven, where his ancestor, Sarah Ravencroft, is under scrutiny that her past wasn't that of a healer but a witch. In getting to the bottom of this, the mystery... In getting to the bottom of this mystery, the gang has run-ins with giant turkeys and running pumpkins as they try and take down a real witch. So, it's fair to say that right from the beginning, there's a couple of differences between this movie and the last one. The first one, perhaps notably, is that Shaggy has been recast. It's no longer Billy Well, but it has been replaced by Scott Irons. So, JB, this is something you pointed out. How do you two feel about that kind of recast i mean i swear that i got it wrong in the first episode i thought it was scott Irons for i think both even back then i wasn't aware that it was billy west um but it confuses me yeah i i like scott Irons shaggy better than billy west but they are kind of hard to distinguish when you go like when you're watching them back to back mm, yeah to I the point so where too. i didn't notice i mean like Honestly, JB and I are complete like opposites when it comes to movies. I can tell you so much about the plot and the story, whereas JB is very much like, this is the cast, this is the music score, and kind of knows the more behind the scenes things. So again, like you said, it was quite seamless. I can't say that I ever noticed. No, no. Mm -hmm. But it, I guess it's, I don't know, it, tonally though, I think that change kind of sets up where it's a bit more... I don't know, it, it's distinct, so it's not the exact same crew as the first time, so perhaps that leans into whether it's, you know, a direct continuation or not, I'm not sure. But what's everyone's opinion on, I guess, the opening? Because it is its own standalone film, and it starts in quite a peculiar way. I mean, I quite like the opening. I mean, one of the questions I was going to ask that kind of links to that of the opening is I was always really kind of curious as to what that mystery would have been. So we later find out that it had been set up by Ben Ravencroft, but it was still something that they'd engaged in and I was always curious as to what it was they'd had to solve. So do you two have any kind of speculations on what that mystery would have been or any more details of it? Um, well, in terms of the story, I guess it's kind of revealed that what happened was there's supposedly two disgruntled security guards that, that, I guess, what do you call it, a museum creator was, like, cutting their funding. And so for that reason, that's why they decided to to get angry. But then that raises the question, like, did Ben Ravencroft pay off the museum creator to cut the funding to make that motive? Or was there no funding? Like, it gets to a point where in that scenario, what's real and what's fake? Because obviously, unless the police are paid off, those two people are still going to jail for some supposed crime. So it's like, it, it's a bit confusing. Like, what's real, what's fake? It, it honestly doesn't really make too much sense. Yeah, for me, okay, well, first as a basis, I don't know if I love when they're starting in the middle or at the end of a mystery when we start movies, because then I'm like, wait, I want to know that story before we jump into this one. Like, why are you why are you just telling me about this? I want to know about this mystery now. I like cold opens when we get, like, the monster of the actual movie haunting something, you know, and the gang hasn't seen or heard about it yet, but we know about it. Uh, but this one, for sure, I feel like there's so many unanswered questions, even when we get the reveal at the end that, was, that it was all, like, fake and Ben Ravencroft paid these people like did he pay the security guards did you know there's I feel like this one had so many questions and they just like needed a quick setup to get us into the movie and I don't feel like it was very well thought out but the scene in itself was a lot of fun 
Yeah, I mean, it was fun, like you said. I think the musical score that went over it also made it really engaging. But like you said, in terms of a more cold opening, I think there was lots of things that they could have done to kind of introduce the Ben Ravencroft character. So for example, you see Velma's a huge fan. It could be that she dragged them along to some kind of book signing or something. There were certainly a lot of other ways that they could have handled that opening as opposed to yeah. kind of picking up at the end of a mystery. Especially because in this kind of lineology, Velma is the owner of a bookshop. So it could have been like yeah. she needed help, you know, setting up a book signing or like a meet and greet or any number of things. Like maybe he just released a new book and there was something going on there. But my thing initially with this is that I think this almost acts as the opposite of Zombie Island's opening. Whereas that opened to show, I guess, Fret, you know, the with the moat monster lashes out and hurts them. This is kind of an, an opposite of that. It's a very cartoony, almost like, I guess, classic Scooby-Doo type setup where they're replacing mannequins like they quite often do, replacing statues. So it is definitely setting up a more playful film, I kind of feel. Yeah, and the reason for that, actually, uh, so after the success of, success of Zombie Island, um, Warner Brothers, like, realized, like, oh, Gooby's still relevant, people still like it. And because for Zombie Island, they, like, the writers and everything, the crew that worked on the movie had free range. Like, they had no uh, executive hands in their work, and so they were, that's why... You know, that movie goes as hard as it does. But then for Witch's Ghost, you know, executives started getting their hands in this movie's script. And we're like, oh, let us change some stuff. And, you know, and so originally the movie was just going to be the original Witch's Ghost story where uh, they pull the, un the mask off and everything, you know, because we had like two witches in this movie. So it's just going to be the first witch. And then the writer of the movie was like, no, no. We had real creatures in the previous movie. We're going to make them real again. And so that's where Sarah Ravencroft came from, was like, we got to have a real witch now, now that we've had the fake witch story. So this one this one got a little messy in the writing, I will say, but that's, I feel like, where the kind of cartoony opening comes from again is, the executives were like, we got to make it a little more cartoony and not so dark this time. Yeah, almost kind of re-engaging with the concept, even briefly, that Scooby-Doo mm -hmm. is prominently unmaskings. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like after such a tangent from what Scooby-Doo has been in Zombie Island, they almost wanted to claw that back right from the beginning, like, to the audience, like, don't you forget, this, this is yep. predominantly unmaskings, this is what happens in Scooby-Doo. Just to kind of bring it back a little bit, I think. I mean, for sure. have they revealed if they when, when in the timeline this is, like, if it is just after Zombie Island? So, okay, because again, I have my own timeline created. Originally, yes, these movies were supposed to be just one after the other, but then, you know, years later, people started making new stories and this and that, and we have a return to Zombie Island now, and um, so, originally, yes, this was supposed to just kind of follow up from Zombie Island. Not, like, directly, but, like, you know, they didn't really have any big mysteries in between. But now, with all the new stuff, um, it has separated Zombie Island from Witch's Ghost. So, there is a bunch of, like, movies and stories in between Zombie Island and Witch's Ghost now. So... It's kind of however you want to take it. Do you want to take Witch's Ghost as the quote-unquote true sequel to Zombie Island, or do you want to space it out? Hmm. So that is quite interesting, because I guess the reason that I ask is I always associate, and I think a lot of people do, because I guess it's the same animation studio, uh, you know, released pretty much, you know, chronologically. But also the outfits that they're wearing remain the same. Like, I'm not really a big fan of them, but the kind of revised Fred and Daphne outfits, they're different. But, I don't know, just coming from Zombie Island, like, just taking these one after the other, I could imagine that a lot of people that love Zombie Island would have been put off by this, because I don't know what it is about the opening. I instantly see that style of animation and think, okay, so this is, like, the darker side of Scooby-Doo. Not that I want it to be, like, you know, horror-horror, but 
I don't know. It's just I don't. It doesn't feel right to, for me looking back at this movie with hindsight to see them in this kind of art style just doing goofy things, and then the whole setup eventually is just a bit a bit ridiculous at the start. Like I don't know. Is there a scene in the start where Scooby? I want to say they jump off of a exhibit in a very cartoon like way, which you'd get in Zombie Island as well. But I feel like this pretty much sets up the opposite of what Zombie Island does, which is okay, but it ultimately is quite similar to Zombie Island in that there's real threat. Yeah, that's, I mean, you see right at the beginning when they're in the museum, you know, they're in costumes, you know, like they're the exhibit. And like you said, they kind of like jump out at the gladiators and do the little like running in the air before they can move and whatever. So it really does backtrack i guess you could say from what they were doing with zombie island right at the beginning and so you definitely with this movie don't have that much of a feeling with zombie island of like oh my gosh they're actually dealing with a real threat at least not until the like very very end and then you're like oh here we are mm, see that's the thing as well i i, I don't know um and I think I'm asking this to you specifically, Smash, because whilst I guess Millie and I were around at the time, we don't really know the the context around things. The poster for Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, the one where like Scooby's at the front and Shaggy's clinging onto his tail, and the ghost of Sarah Ray, or the witch of Sarah Ravencroft is like to the back. Is that the actual poster that they used for everything? Because that kind of gives the whole game away right from the start. Yes, and this is exactly what I was saying with the last movie with Zombie Island, because that one gives no indication of the cat creatures. This one, that is the only poster, the only cover, the only anything to promote the movie that they've ever done. There's no alternative one. You know, there's not one with the whole gang, because we have Velma in the background too, but that's it. But yeah, so you watch this movie, you buy this movie or whatever, and you're expecting that witch, and then you get the fake witch, and then all of a sudden, right at the end, the witch that's on the cover randomly appears finally. And so it's so just, like, not as consistent and smooth, and it's just kind of... Yeah, so it really does give it away, right, as you pick it up. It does. But that being said, like, I think as the movie progresses and they arrive in Oak Haven, I kind of still felt like I was in a little bit of a false sense of security after Zombie Island. Like, when they see the I Met the Ghost and Live t-shirts, it's kind of like, yeah, but we've we've met ghosts, we've met zombies, they're not always going to be that bad. Like, are they just setting another scenario up like this where they try and make it sound worse than it is? And I don't know, I do feel like Zombie Island was still quite prominent when I first watched this, and so it was kind of like, is it going to be that bad? I certainly had, maybe for a few minutes, I had a few doubts because I don't think I'd seen the poster at this time. No, I mean, I forget when I last saw this. Obviously, I don't think it had a theatrical release, but I think I had the tape. And oh, I don't know, how would you have seen this, Millie? Like, at maybe, first? like, Boomerang or something? Oh. Because my parents yeah. didn't really like animated movies, so I never got DVDs and stuff. It was just what I watched when I got home from school. That's a good point. So you wouldn't have really seen that. Oh, I, no. I'm getting timelines mixed up. When is this? This is 1999. And for the life of me, yeah. I can't remember what technology was about in 1999. If there were DVDs <laughs> or if there were just the tapes or if the things even... Was so, Boomerang a thing? I don't know. That's just when I started watching Scooby-D. Golly. Boomerang, I don't think, was quite a thing. Um, back then, I don't, DVDs weren't quite a thing. I think originally it just came out on VHS tape. Um, and then like maybe two, three years afterwards it had a DVD release. So the, the original way you would have seen it, I think would be on TV. Cause like, I mean, I don't know if you, uh, I didn't see it the year it premiered, but like they did a Cartoon Network premiere of the movie and then released it on VHS. Hmm, see, I don't think I saw this when it premiered either. I mean, I, I don't think I would have, or at least if I did, I don't think I'd have remembered it. Gosh, how, how old was I in You 19, were one. No, I was one years old, so I don't think <laughs> oh. I was tuning into many many networks <laughs> then, but 
eventually. <laughs> yeah, I was only three. I mean, I know I had X amount of tapes of Scooby Doo when I was little. It was, it was the 2002 movie, I think the 2004 movie, Zombie Island, Witch's Ghost, and. Oh, see, I don't remember watching Cyber Chase until DVD, but this is kind of nice, this kind of setup, because for all we're looking back at it on hindsight, you know, this is the poster, it gives it away. On one hand, I'm kind of like, okay, obviously they want to get people interested. They can have, and so they need a witch. That's, you know, on the cover. That's kind of a given, because at least Zombie Island had its namesake on the on the cover. But I kind of feel that this should have been the green fake witch on yeah. the cover, if anything. But then that's, you know, looking back at it, you know, now saying, okay, so this is the promotion. It may not have been the way most people would have viewed it at the time. But. No, I'd agree with you on that. Yeah, I... And, like, in terms of, like you were saying, with the green ghost and that kind of thing, I feel like they did set something... something okay up with that. Like, it was very much a typical Scooby formula. Like, there were the clear, like, clues and things. You saw all the broken branches. There was that kind of... Was it called snap powder or something? Mm -hmm. It was set up, like... A normal mystery. If you put an episode of Scooby Doo on tomorrow, you could see something like that. And I think, like Smash was saying, when you get the external voices as opposed to just the creators, they want to like boost it up a level. So they were like, okay, well, you know, we've done standard episodes of Scooby Doo. How do we make this different? And it's almost like they've dropped an episode in the middle of a movie, <laughs> but the episode in itself was good. This time, they're real again. Well, I almost feel like they, like, so the executives kind of took over and were like, hey, we're doing this story with this green witch and whatever. And then they were like, yeah, well, that fills about 30 minutes. So how do we make this longer? And then the writer of the actual movie was like, well, let's include a real witch story now yeah like like we said it's like an episode dropped in the middle you said that's about 30 minutes and you know if you're watching yeah. them on tv they are like 20 to 30 minutes so yeah that would have just fit quite nicely but i don't think this was intended to be a simple episode purely for the fact that i don't think that there was a series running alongside this and also no. it's got some decent I think, star power yeah, with and tim I mean, curry it's certainly a noticeable story arc perhaps to exist outside of a story and i think one thing that makes this and i am just kind of working three points from the movie here but i think one thing that does also make this quite prominent is the introduction of the hex girls yes i mean oh, yeah. if nothing else this movie gave us the hex girls and they've gone on to be iconic mm -hmm. for so many you know tv shows films i think that they should get their own their own thing you know and this is the start uh, of it and i guess don't worry Ooh. I got stories for that. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we want stories. Okay. Okay. So, yes, the Hex Girls were introduced in this movie. They have become iconic. Um, they were intended to just basically help boost sales for this movie because this was the first Scooby Doo movie that had a soundtrack released alongside it. So, you could, like, <laughs> by the CD and it had the music from the movie, but there was also a handful of tracks that they made just for the soundtrack. Um, so they they were mainly just kind of like, <laughs> trying to be promotional, you know, buy the soundtrack, listen to the movie's music and buy, you know. Anyway, so then after the movie did well, uh, Cartoon Network actually came to Warner Brothers and we're like, hey, we kind of like those Hex Girls characters. Can we do a spin-off series? And they started developing it. It didn't get like super, super far, but then it kind of, you know, got dropped and then uh, they keep, keep trying. They keep trying to develop it, but like something gets in the way, someone says no, something just keeps happening. And uh, all three girls, voice actresses that did the hex girls in that movie still do the hex girls today because they they just appeared in an episode like a year or two ago um and so they keep like you know bringing it up and being like yeah we keep like getting called for meetings on this spinoff that's never happening so it is 
it is an active development, but it keeps something keeps happening. So fingers crossed it'll happen one day. I mean, that would be amazing. And that being said, like, it is great to see that they almost seem to love the role as much as we enjoy watching it, just because they do just mm-hmm. keep appearing in episodes and it's almost like really exciting and really refreshing when like the hex girls walk in and you're like, oh my gosh, this this is like one of the standout episodes of this series. Like, was it Mystery Incorporated where there's one where they turn up and oh, Daphne yeah, joins the, the Hex Girls? The Trap and... of Love. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's like, mm, yes, yes, I like that a lot. You want to hear a funny story about that? Yes. Actually, I would. this is kind of a detour. Yeah, we want to hear So, you know, they, ap- <laughs> they appeared in episode seven of Mystery Incorporated and that's when Daphne joined them as crush and whatever and they were in you know new outfits for the series and whatever and then if you recall they appeared again in season two i don't know what episode that season but they appeared to help shaggy and scooby you know play the battle music and they were in their classic designs um their classic outfit in that episode and that was from actually fans backlashing their new outfits and so they say in the episode mm-hmm. yeah our fans prefer our original designs and that was because actual fans wanted their original outfit i like, I like that because like they've they've like responded to it not in like a self like deprecating way where they just show up in like their new outfits and go oh you know some people don't like it but like you know we like it i mean Obviously, like I don't think that they should pander to all of the loud voices in the audience, but like I just I think it's mm-hmm. nice that they added that touch and uh, yeah, and they are iconic. Like literally, I think that you know if they get the voice talents around, I would legitimately go to a Hex Girls concert. I'm not even kidding. Like <laughs> right? COVID too. permitting, I'd yeah. fly all the way to the US just for that concert. I think that'd be amazing. Last year, we so we have a store here in America called Hot Topic, mm-hmm. and um, they're like pushing out Scooby Doo merch left and right lately. And I'm just like, I can't keep up. But um, last year, they started releasing Hex Girls merch, and there is a t shirt that I got. Thank you to my beautiful girlfriend, she gave me for Christmas. It is like a Hex Girls concert t-shirt, and I'm like, this this is my favorite thing ever. That is amazing. Oh, they could do it on Australia and everything. Like, they, is there a... Wait, yeah. No, I'm not going to get into that, but... They, oh, I, I just want to go to a Hex Girls concert. Me too. <laughs> right? That's what I need from life. Are you going to do, like, the dancing style of, like, Scooby and everybody when they first see... The hex girls, like when they walk in on the rehearsal, <laughs> you're gonna like yeah, replicate right. those moves. I think I'll do like the zombie dance move from Mystery Incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but I would, I would love that, and I think that's just a testament to how iconic it's been because I feel that everyone always goes on about the hex girls, and yet I guess maybe in this movie we learn more about the hex girls than we ever do because we learn that I guess Thorn has. A dad that she knows they all talk about like oh i forget the name of all of them that aren't thorn and for that reason i feel guilty there's thorn luna and is it dusk yeah and dusk yep whichever one's the blonde one they have a dad that's a dentist who fit their fangs and i feel like beyond this movie the hex girls are just there as a, v- a very welcomed cameo but i think this really humanized them yeah for sure and i enjoyed that a lot an awful lot I mean, did you, did you kind of pick up, well, obviously everyone picked up on it, but did you kind of share the thing that they were trying to create in this movie of making them, like, one of the potential kind of suspects? Did you think mm. they came across as suspicious at all? Because I kind of think that because they had such an... <laughs> I, I was I was a child when I watched this. Like because I thought they had such like a nice intro with the music and that kind of thing, I was like, no, it's not gonna be them. I mean, to be fair, maybe that's like you being sheltered from animated movies, because like often in like animation, the the people with the catchiest songs are the villain. So yeah, I was true. a bit thrown off. <laughs> true. I think I'm more with Millie. Where I mean, the first introduction we have is them, you know, coming out of the shadows down the alleyway and showing up in front of Shaggy and Scooby, but I just feel like the music kind of cut it out for me. I was like, eh, no, they're jamming away. They can't be it. 
No, like after that concert when Fred's like, okay, me and Daphne are following them. I was like, why? Why are you doing this? You don't need to do this. <laughs> no, I will say that I think the movie really wanted us to suspect them. Because I almost feel yeah, that Daphne's jealousy or I guess teasing of Fred kind of with Thorn kind of reminded me a bit of Lena in Zombie Island. So there's always kind of like that other female character that comes in and kind of causes a yeah. rift between them, even if it is fleeting and a bit, you know, played and off the joke. Because then they were one of the cat people, you're drawing parallels, is yeah. it like that again? But... Mm-hmm, true. And there's three cat people, so I guess it's possible there could be three witches. So, <laughs> true. I don't know. I don't know. And, and also the imagery of three witches, obviously... I'm not sure how many people that would have been watching this in 1999 as like huge, you know, Shakespeare fanatics. Mm -hmm. But, you know, obviously there's Macbeth and there's, I guess, if you want to say Hocus Pocus was kind of popular then. I mean, it still is mm -hmm. now. So, Free and Witches is kind of a trope. Witches. Even, I want to say that even the hair colours match up with the witches in Hocus Pocus. Yes. Oh, well. Blonde, yeah. black and kind of like an auburn. Yeah, yeah. So moving on in the movie, one of the next things that I've kind of got written down that I wanted to say is I feel very conflicted with the timings at the end. Like when they first unmask the, the Green Witch, I'm like, oh, this was over too soon. But then when they try and take on that next story, I almost feel like the switch around from Ben Ravencroft wanting to release the witch to them wanting to re-imprison them happens within the space of a few seconds See, that's the so thing. i do feel like there was a lot mm. of timing issues towards the end like i said it was almost oh no this is over really quickly but then they also hadn't left enough time and so it was like i just want to release them i've been looking for this book for 40 years <laughs> go away go back go back so here's the thing i think that this movie has one huge problem and as much as i hate to say it i think it's ben ravencroft because <laughs> i wrote down in my notes like is ben lying about not knowing about oak haven becoming a huge tourist attraction now if that's true then that means that ben ravencroft hasn't been back to oak haven in a year like he says okay which is fine let's just take him at his word but then in that case why take like why dedicate your life to moving away because you see him in an apartment it looks like it's in new york or somewhere it's definitely mm. a city and i've tried writing novels in the past even short stories maybe i'm just incompetent but it's tricky and this guy's supposedly written bestseller after bestseller which takes time you know so he's been there with a typewriter banging out novels in a city and he's not been back to Oak Haven for a year and yet now that he is back he's obsessed with this book that he needs to find yeah. like why become a novelist why not become a builder or an archaeologist or you, a historian yeah. or anything else you talking about his past I have a huge issue as well that kind of came up for me and I kind of thought about this a bit more on the rewatch why is it that the second he gets this spell book in his hand he has all these powers Shaggy and Scooby can then take it away and he keeps the powers because he can get the trees to uproot yeah. and things. But he didn't have the powers, even though he's not holding the spell book at this time, he didn't have the powers before to use them to find the spell book initially. So you could say that his powers kind of were attached to the spell book, but then later on, he gets the spell book taken yeah. away from him and, he's and still he can jumping still about like Spider Man. Yeah. And he, like his glasses, for some reason, the spell book makes him lose his glasses and he doesn't need it. So he is literally <laughs> Spider Man. So, but then it's not like when the spell book's taken away, he's like Velma, like, my glasses, my glasses. Yeah, it, it's very uncohesive because it's like, okay, where does his powers originate? It's like, oh, I'm a warlock. So in theory, he should have had these powers all along. So why weren't they used to try and find the book? Why did. They That's only appear some... at the very end of the movie. My only guess, but even I am not all, all in on this, is that like maybe he didn't know the spells, but I'm like, you could not have memorized those that fast. Yeah, I mean, it's not like it's simple things, is it? I mean, to be honest, the movie takes a very, I want to say, and with all due respect, the movie takes a very goofy turn the second he gets hold of that spell book. Like, there's the running pumpkins, there's the big turkey, and at one point, Shaggy even turns around and says, even I'm not scared of that. 
And then they yeah. do change it afterwards, like, okay, maybe I am, and start running. But if you get Shaggy and Scooby in a movie saying, I'm not scared of that, everything that their characters stand for has just been dragged away. Like, they're scared of literally everything. And if if like there was one villain which was the witch in a costume this is like the super villain this is where it gets real and for them to even turn around and say yeah i'm not scared it's just like okay they they messed up here hmm. they should have been petrified every second and i don't know why choose a turkey like a massive pumpkin i think would have been more effective i don't know it's it does take a very very wild turn like from i guess calm collected with like a few peaks to then have this guy literally and it is i'm not exaggerating he does start leaping about and he stands he like yeah. sits on a roof exactly like spider-man he then starts cackling yeah. and screaming i see i want to compare this scene to scooby-doo 2 monsters unleashed okay we see there that there's a collection of monsters that stops them from returning the disc to where it needs to go. Here, there is a collection of monsters that stops them from getting the book where it yeah, needs that to did go. Remind me of it, but yeah. in Monsters Unleashed, they are they are scary things that they have faced, and Shaggy and Scooby are petrified. But here, it's like almost like a comedic version of that scene because. I don't, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I just think that, like, like I said, the main quote for me that I took away from that is Shaggy just saying, even I'm not scared of this. And really, I don't think it was anything to be scared of when it was supposed to be this grand finale, this huge twist that made everyone scared. Yeah. Well, like, I hate to say it, but I feel like this movie goes from, like you were saying, like, oh, you know, it can't be over yet with the first witches unmasking, you know, like, that was too short to, I feel like it goes to, like, okay, is this movie over yet? Like, I'm I'm over this type of thing. I'm, yeah. I'm over the running and the chasing and the, you know, I, I just feel like, I don't know, I've never, I'm gonna say it right now, I've never loved this movie and it's just because of this end, I'm like, it just drags on way too much, and I, you could clearly see they're trying to just cover up yeah. time, you know, make up for time. And so that's, I feel like they kind of were just like, now Ben Ravencroft can jump everywhere and he doesn't <laughs> need his glasses. And now this Jack Lantern came to life. He's just going to grab Daphne, but, you know, he'll get sliced in a second, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. No, I do feel like somebody just needs to edit this where the credits roll the second the masks pulled off the green witch and that's yeah. the movie. And they're afraid of getting dark even with that scene. Like Velma, when I, I watched this like for the first time in a while. So Daphne gets attacked by the pumpkins. Velma picks up the butter churn and I'm like, okay, she's going to start bashing some pumpkins. But then she does this thing where she just spills the contents on the floor and the pumpkins suddenly decide yeah. to run into it and start slipping everywhere. And another thing that gets quite kind of goofy at the end of the movie is the witch literally tells everyone how to defeat her. Like, oh, you know, it needs to be a virtuous song. Yeah. It's like saying, okay, I'm going out of my house. I've locked the door, but the key's hidden under the mat there. Yes. Don't rob me. You don't make it that obvious. It's so stupid. And it's clear the gang has no idea how to do it. Like Shaggy tries chucking a bucket of water <laughs> yeah. on her. Like, okay, just let them keep up with that. Well, like, okay, I know this is a movie, you know, so it's not going to play out like this. But my thing is, like, this freaking witch, Sarah Ravencroft, I'm like, okay, you're you're trying to get this book, like, in the time that they're trying to find someone who's a Wiccan and find the spell, you could be controlling the world at this point. Like, yeah. why are we so obsessed with this book, like, lady? You got out. Go do your thing. Ben Ravencroft had that book for two minutes and he's given himself 20-20 vision. He can fly. <laughs> he can make pumpkins walk. He can make turkeys, like, times ten in size. She was aware of her powers for surely a few decades. If oh, he yeah, can do uh, that in two minutes, like you said, she's got world domination <laughs> in that time. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, how did it say that she was even put in the book in the first place? Um, even... It was a Wiccan or a witch. Another like, virtuous witch had put her in the book. So what happened The same to way them? that Thorn did. 
I'd like to know what happened to them because... Presumably they must have buried the spell book in the hope that nobody else would ever find it. I think this Ben guy's an idiot. Like, he he was literally looking all that time and he didn't once tr- like, try and look. Yeah. Oh, it's just... He annoys me. <laughs> he does annoy me. And it, it's a shame <laughs> because I think Tim Curry, maybe, I don't know how hard they tried to do to get him. You know, he's kind of like a big deal. Like, he was the original Pennywise and stuff. And he was meant to be in the 2002 movie. But I just think he's, he's wasted here, in all honesty. Like, it... And... Like, I just wish that they'd done the reveal sooner, maybe around the same time as the original witch reveal, and then maybe made, like, built up the portrayal with Sarah Ravencroft, like, maybe she needed him for one more thing that would have made sense, or something other than just turkeys exploding and (laughs) stuff going on. See, I agree, too, because, you know, he's very, you know, very well known and stuff, and I feel like he, they don't let him be who he is until like the last 15 minutes of the movie and you're like oh here's tim curry now and you know like i mean he does show up in another scooby movie uh not ben ravencroft but tim curry he voices another character in another scooby movie and i'm like even then i'm just like you they don't know how to write for tim curry for scooby-doo I'm like he can be such a good villain but you you need to paste your your movie better yeah, I'd like a I'd like a meta Tim Curry appearance. Like he could be a creepy clown, something oh, kooky, goofy. a bit goofy, not like yeah. something that's meant to be serious that then does like a full. Yeah. you know what I would like is to go back to the the format of Zombie Island, where there's no other producers getting involved. You just have the creators, and mm. to see what they could do, having mm-hmm. him voice a character see, that because is the dream. they developed some amazing characters in there. They developed people who you thought you could trust that then turned out to be the cat people. They created these really scary transformations in the zombies and then they turned out to be good. It's kind of like, what could they have done? Because, I don't know, it was a very quick switch that flips. When has, like, studio intervention worked out for a movie? Like, literally this year we had the release of the Snyder Cut. You know, I didn't see it, I didn't even see the original Justice League, but, like... There's real hype around director's cuts nowadays that it's like, I kind of because wish that they could they do one for these. they have the vision. It is their project in their heart. They are the ones that craft this thing. They see this vision. And then for someone else to come in who doesn't understand how some of the things might link together necessarily and understand the meaning behind some of it to just be like yeah we're getting rid of that we're getting rid of that we need to add something in here though but i don't know why the studio would have done this because everyone loved like you know because I, I guess they got more involved because of the success of zombie island so they wanted the follow up i guess in the the franchise to be a success as well but then you'd think that they'd be pushing for things to be more like zombie island right so let's make this a bit darker let's you know make that a bit more like like this but instead, they kind of find this this balance that is off. Like, it's not cartoony and funny enough to be just a kind of almost guilty pleasure, fun Scooby-Doo movie that you could put on and, like, enjoy things to. But it's also not dark enough to, so that you can sit down and go, oh my gosh, so this is when it got serious. It's just yeah. an awkward thing in the middle. And I don't think it really knows what it wants to be. Yeah, yes, I, I agree. <laughs> Another issue that I have with the kind of story and things is the portrait above the fireplace. So it depicts um, Sarah Ravencroft as a Wiccan. And I want to know the origins of this um, photo. So I'm asking this, I think, more to smash because I feel like you're the kind of Scooby expert. So if anyone's going to know, it'll be you. But in terms of the origins of that... The Scoobert. If it was in Sarah Ravencroft's time, then she then obviously people saw her for what she was a witch so they that's why you know she was captured in the spell book in the first place so okay if it's from that time maybe kind of why does she look like that when people knew what she was she clearly seems quite proud of what she is um but then if it was more recently i know jb came up with the theory maybe it's more recently maybe it was part of ben ravencroft's plan to kind of show her in this really good light 
but then how does he know the exact kind of appearance of that buckle that Shaggy finds because he's never seen the spell book? Yeah. So how would he manage to recreate a picture of the one thing that leads Velma to the right place when he's never seen it? So do you have any theories of the origins of that? God, I didn't think of that. My guess... It... Okay, even even kind of my theory doesn't fully connect, but my what I'm thinking is that that was like a painting that was done back in Sarah's time, and you know she just kind of said, "Hey, you know, local artist, will you, you know, maybe this is maybe this is before you know she revealed, ha ha ha, I'm a witch, whatever, you know, I don't know the exact timelining, but." You know, I'm I'm thinking she maybe Sarah Ravencroft was like, "Hey, local artist, will you paint a portrait of me? I want it right by this tree, in hopes that a future Ravencroft would get the message. Hey, my book that I'm holding here in this portrait is gonna be right by this tree." Um, but Ben was just dumb and didn't put that together, and then Velma was like, "It's at that tree." And, yeah, you know. Here we are. I still th That's kind of my yeah. guess. I mean, the difficulty with that is even could she have had a transformation? Because the book in itself is different. We see a skull on the front of the actual one, but the buckle bit's still the same. So is it could there have been some kind of transformation where she might have started as a Wiccan? Something happened where everyone was like, Oh, if she can do this, she's a witch. So she actually turned into a witch, at which point she kind of got a new book that replaced just kept that kind of buckle or something ultimately i don't know you see i was gonna say that because they do show a flashback scene where she seems very much like a healer like ben's claiming at first and i kind of have this rule where like if something is explicitly shown in a flashback if that isn't real like they can manipulate like circumstances around it as much as they want for a reveal at the end that's fine but like if the flashback that they're physically showing us, not just talking to us about, is false, that's kind of a bit of a cop-out. See, my guess is that she started as a healer and everything, and then, you know, since she was alive way back when, um, you know, they still did, like, the witch trials and stuff, and so people started to get suspicious and get on her and start calling her a witch, and you know, getting mobs to chase her down, and I think that kind of made her angry and be like, what am I supposed to do? How do I live when I'm being yeah. constantly chased? And I don't know if maybe she came across a different book, she, her anger made this book become evil or something, you know? I don't know how that happened. I mean, one of the first things that she says is this town's going to pay for what it did to me. Isn't that one of the first things yeah. she says? Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, is that even like the fact that maybe the book can change appearances and stuff, is they say at the end, like, or in during the reveal or just before it, like, if you really wanted to help us, like, find if you really wanted to get us to help you find the book, why didn't you just ask us? And then Velm was like, because, you know, he because we never would have agreed to help him if he knew what it was they don't but, need to tell yeah. him what it is like like it's not like he could, he's gonna say he could have said like he's lied to yeah. them the whole movie why does she think that it's out of the question that he would go to them and say hey you know you like my books don't you um i've got something yeah i've got a witch in my family me. tree just just who's got this spell book and i need i need to find it like and even if they, he, they do find yeah. out eventually they would only find out once they found the book which is exactly how it yeah. happens anyway yeah. it could have been like oh my goodness like you know we've got this shed because it didn't need to be the mystery at the beginning like we said he could have literally walked yeah. into velma's bookstore and she would have and freaked she'd, out yeah she'd have like had a, she'd have just been <laughs> like yeah and like been like you know like she's like oh i really admire you and be like oh yeah well like i know what you do i kind of <laughs> have this like mystery thing that i need your help with and that's when he invites them back to Oak Haven because obviously Velma would have just dragged everyone else there. Like, we often oh, see yeah. things like that. Like, is it... I want to say it's the sword and the scoop where there's one place where they're kind of all getting dragged to. Is it, like, a tourist destination she wants to see or something? The library. Yeah, yeah. and, like, they, they do follow her. So she's like, okay, famous author, we're going to Oak Haven. They've got a mystery they want to help us solve. 
But poor it Ben, could he's in like the that. car with her of the course, entire time. They, Maybe that's what made him a villain. Like, of course they would have helped him if they knew that he was looking for a book. It's like... Oh, uh, like, literally. And another question I have about the book, okay, is at the end, we see it surrounded with fire, but we never actually see the book start to deteriorate at all. Do you think that they just were like, okay, because it's supposed to be a kid's movie, we don't want to show too much here or do you think that book couldn't like burn hmm. well okay Velma says you know after we see it trying to catch on fire from a branch falling on it and stuff Velma says something about like I guess or like something like the last book that Ben Ravencroft ever wrote and the world will never get to read it or something to that effect and with Return to Zombie Island having come out almost two years ago, there's been uh, a recent, like, surge of, like, people being like, ooh, are we getting more sequels? And if so, which ones? And which mm -hmm. is Ghost is actually the, the second one that, like, people are very much like, if you do more sequels, we need which is Ghost. Because a lot of people believe that that book didn't burn. And so, so many people are like, that book is still there, or someone else found it, or something. So, you know, I don't know. I just always assume that it burned because of Velma's comment. But, you know, I do see where, like, you guys and other people are coming from, saying we never actually do see it kind of crumble into ash or anything. And so, you know, like, did it, did it not burn? Did it burn? Did... What... If it didn't burn, then what did they do with it? You know, like... Yeah, I think they could do a sequel, to be honest. Like, I don't really want one, whereas, like, you know, in later movies in this kind of early series, like Alien Invasion, I would love a sequel on that. Um, Cyber Chase, I don't think it's as necessary, but it could totally have a sequel. Whereas with this, the way that the Scooby movies are recently, I feel like the only thing that they could do is go back to Oakhaven purely for the reveal that there was a logical explanation for it. Like, that's but they had it. the logical explanation. Then they wanted a ghost. It it would just be like playing like tennis at this point. It's just hitting it backwards and I'm forwards. I'm surprised I'm being as negative as I am about it because obviously, like you kind of tend to glorify things for nostalgia. And I, I kind of want to bring something positive to this conversation, if that's at all possible. I know. <laughs> I do feel bad. Because I, I mean, I do love this movie for nostalgic reasons. I do. Yeah, me too. But I... I enjoy when, I think it's Velma says, during, like, the whole confrontation with Sarah Ravencroft, Ravencroft, not Quaft, <laughs> <laughs> that Shaggy and Scooby need to do this task because they're the fastest. Because I feel that, obviously, everyone just refers to Daphne as the useless one, which I don't think is true at all, because I think very much she fills in a gap, at least more now, as the fighter of the group, which they didn't have before, because for all Fred was the leader... He was... Or he it was a trap. He, was he more wanted strategist. to stand behind the yeah. sidelines and watch. He was more a strategist as opposed to a fighter. And I think that's what Daphne's role is now. Whereas Shaggy and Scooby remain to be the comic relief. And it's always going to be true. And I think that that's what they should be. Because they're just an iconic duo for that reason. Do you know but what? I'm... In this movie, mm. with them being the fastest, that gives them a purpose. It gives them an edge over the rest. When they're meant to be running away quite a lot of, quite a lot of the time. And... Yeah. So I, just, I, I want liked to draw it another parallel here. You remember earlier when I compared um, the scene in Monsters Unleashed with the monsters and then the witch's ghost almost been kind of like a more comedic version of that with it just been turkeys and pumpkins. There's also a scene in that movie where they where she says, Velma says, that um, Shaggy and Scooby have to take the control panel because they can run the fastest. Oh, really? It's another panel. I don't know another... said that, but that We, makes we sense. only watched that like two days ago, that's why I know. But like, <laughs> yeah, she does hand yeah, it to them. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Because, yeah, in, in Scooby Doo 2, um, Daphne kind of goes up to the news reporter, you know, and is like trying to confront her. And, and she's like, What do you do for the game? Fred's the leader, Velma's the smart one, all you are is a pretty little face. You know, so then Daphne's like, oh, okay, I'm going to show you what I can do. And then, yeah, as you said later on, Velma's like, you guys are faster than me. You guys can get this. 
there before I can and I'll distract these monsters while yeah. you get it in there. So yeah, no, I totally see where you're coming from. And I also think that this movie was a nice time to do that. Um the witch's ghost to like acknowledge, acknowledge that Shaggy and Scooby have some benefit because in Zombie Island, we're like, they're like, oh, we didn't even bother to make dolls of them. They're like useless. What are they going to do? And then they run in and save the day. So I think it was really nice to almost see a little bit of acknowledgement in the next movie on from that, that, okay, they do do something. Mm. Yes, for sure. And especially because like for the first half of this movie, they're, just sitting in that restaurant, <laughs> you know, eating the whole restaurant out, which I'm not gonna lie, I love that. Like, even though they're not doing a lot throughout the movie, I just love that they just eat this poor guy's restaurant out, and he's just like, I'm going to the store, I gotta go get more food, you know? But then, like, the later half, they're like, oh, well, we ate all that food, so we got all this energy, and we can run super fast. I mean, yeah. here's the thing, like, I feel like the gang kind of did get, like, <laughs> preemptive revenge on Ben with, like, Velma, <laughs> Velma being with him all the way to yeah. there, and then the bill that he must have got from the restaurant, so they do kind of drive him over the edge. I mean, honestly, I think it's so funny as well, in that eating scene, just how stressed by the end of it the chef is like the restaurant owner is just sat there like passed out sweating like yeah it's okay <laughs> bye to be fair like, that's a holiday for him isn't it like, he could probably go on like vacation he yeah but I imagine to... how much work went into cooking all that for them oh and the and washing up i also find it funny how they can i don't know like i don't know if jb will say that this is more part of the like cartoon child like thing that he was talking about at the beginning but like i also find it a little bit funny how like their stomachs have grown so much but then when they see the hex girls they like try and like lift it up so it almost looks like muscle and that kind of thing yep see that's that's a bit of a goofy scene because they're like trying so hard to like impress them and then they are like scared off because then they find out that they've got fangs but then after it's revealed that the fangs are fake, I obviously don't want it to be like this subplot where like Shaggy's trying to like get with one of the hex girls, but it's a bit like, you know, it's kind of set up something that they didn't really do, even after it was revealed that the I one thing like, that scared them off was revealed as fake. I like, you know, so like you said, they're in this movie, they try to like impress the hex girls and whatever, but then in the following movie, Alien Invaders, they try to impress Crystal and Amber. And so I kind of like that, where it's like they, they tried in this movie, you know, with their uh, stomach being super big. But then, like, later they're like, okay, hey, we learned from our mistake. We're not going to eat before we meet the girls. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's like what? They're like passed out in the desert. <laughs> like, that's like the opposite yeah. of eating. <laughs> So I think that concludes everything that I've written down to talk about for this movie. Smash, last, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is breaking there. <laughs> last episode, you came at us with some really kind of interesting theories that I guess we'd not thought about from Zombie Island. Is there any kind of theories or anything like that that you're aware of from this movie that you'd like to bring up at all? Or while Smash is thinking, JB, do you have any other notes that you kind of had any questions, theories? I mean, I've got a question about, I guess, the whole Scooby franchise, you know, as a whole, that's kind of inspired by this movie. Okay. And that is a supernatural solution to a supernatural threat a cop-out? Because for all they've got, like, the witch there, I kind of feel like, at the end of the day, Scooby-Doo is meant to be about solving the mystery, either who did it or how can we solve it. So we've got this ghost mm -hmm. that should be an imposing, like, threat that we can all kind of not imagine, because it's obviously, you know, there's not, like, witches flying about randomly in, like, the real world. But then to have that threat just be, like, taken away with just, okay, let's read a passage from this book. Yeah, it almost wasn't even Mr. Ink, it was, like, Thorn. Yeah. That kind of mm -hmm. eventually took the threat away. So that's, that's what I was kind of wondering, because I don't know how else they could have done it, but I just think once you add something supernatural in, if there's then this, like, secret thing you have to do, like, this mystical thing you have to do, it kind of just takes everything away from it. Also, with this movie, I, I'm a bit more okay with the supernatural solution, because 
you know, I feel like a lot of times there's, like, if there is a supernatural situation, they solve it without a supernatural solution because, like, you know, they have to cover it up and be like, oh, nope, everything's fine, there was nothing there, or whatever. But, like, in this movie, the mayor of the town was there and witnessed it all, and so there was a supernatural solution for it. And so he, like, can't deny it and whatever. Yeah. And I really appreciate that for this movie. I mean, we didn't really get, like, I would have liked maybe a, a day after and kind of the after effects, you know, the town kind of waking up and being like, what happened here? And the mayor happened to be like, oh, we just were prepping for our next festival. Yeah, or we something. just <laughs> magically <laughs> snapped you know? this giant turkey here. Yeah. That's the thing that they always, like, this on the last one left... The, the universe of Scooby-Doo with more questions than answers, like... I mean, they were the both the first set one, over one day, weren't they? Yeah, like, at the end of the first one, there was this huge tell-all that was going to come out on, like, the TV. Mm. And in this, a prominent writer goes missing off the face of the Earth. There's a massive turkey, which, you know, could have serious implications Spoiler. in terms of, you know, feeding people. Yeah, I don't it could know, feed like, the entire town for a week. Or, you know, like, there's implications... Oh, yeah. That, like, I'm just like, oh, I wonder what would happen there, I wonder what would happen here. Which is is good, I guess, but I just don't really like the loose ends. Especially when, like, with the knowledge that if they ever did a sequel, yeah. at least nowadays, it would just be, okay, so the giant turkey was a robot and, like, Ben Ravencroft mm -hmm. was hallucinating or something. And, like, okay, yep. how did that turkey go from violently trying to run down everybody to managing to make it the showcase of the event that it was calm enough to just stand there and have its photo taken. But not just that, like, when the book is destroyed or when, like, the book's kind of intervened with, like, the, I think the pumpkins get defeated, everything mystical gets sucked into the book. And obviously, like, the turkey itself isn't from the mystical realm, mm. but you'd at least assume that the effects of the spell would reverse, or there could be many other things left over that, like, Ben cursed or that Sarah cursed that are still there. Like, if the turkey can yeah. remain big, there's still some, like, spells that could have lasted. But, I don't know. I think that that's kind of all I've got written down. I guess one notes. thing that I kind of picked up on from what you were talking about, just in terms of you were saying about a non-supernatural solution, I kind of don't think there could have been one. They'd already had two unmaskings in this movie, one at the beginning and one with the green ghost. That it's kind of like, surely there wasn't another unmasking or another kind no, of non even something like burning the book like getting a hold of the book like having to like dodge defeat an army of supernatural threats to be able to get the book to destroy it i yeah. think maybe would have been a bit less kooky but at the end of the day it is meant to be kooky i'd almost state like it's not meant to be like this serious kind of movie it's it's meant to be fun and ultimately I don't think it's a bad time, really. Mm. So, unless... So, to answer... Oh, sorry, after you. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> no, I was just going to answer your question, finally. Oh, the theories and... Um, so, my only thing I want to know is, uh, you know, since we learned that Thorn is part Wiccan... Does that mean that somewhere down the line she's related to Ben and Sarah? Or was there another... Or, 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 mm. here's another theory. I, I like is that theory. picture? Is that picture in Ben's office or whatever actually Thorne's ancestor because it was depicted as a Wiccan? Ooh, that's interesting. And... Could Thorne have been an ancestor from the Wiccan that put Sarah in the spell book? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that's interesting, because quite often, like, Oakhaven's, like, depicted as this relatively small kind of town, and obviously that's where Thorne's dad remains, and that's obviously where Ben's from. So, I don't know, there could have been something in that, and that actually is really interesting. I can't see how, how that she would go anywhere. She said that but... it was 1 16th on her mother's side, I think. 
I think looking at some of the time period things, you could almost imagine like 16 generations, right? Perhaps. Yeah, I would assume so, yeah. Although it wouldn't even be 16, it'd be four, right? Yeah, that was quite feasible. So yeah. maybe there's like a good book and a bad book lying around somewhere in Oakhaver. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That um oh my god oh see that would have been the such a cool fight if you could just find the good buckle. book. Well, uh, and th here's the annoying thing though the buckle. I don't think Scooby had to dig particularly deep down. He just finds it. So surely, like, because you you can say that you measure when things were put there by how deep it is. You know, like yeah. that's how you, like people age fossils and stuff. So it seems relatively mm -hmm. recent. I mean, obviously, I don't think they're thinking about that when they animated it, but. You know, if we're going by that logic, I think it could be Thorne's ancestor, and I almost think that they could be more in in Oak Haven that could have pointed to that. I don't. I wonder if that was their original plan. I really like that. Because to have theory. two Wiccan, a warlock kind of Wiccan, in a in the same movie from the same town, I think that's kind of more than coincidence, right? It is. Ooh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And such a small place as well. Oh, yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> so that is a very interesting theory, guys. Let us know what you think in the comments below. And as always, it has come to that time. So, JB, Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Smash or pass? So, I have a lot of problems with this. I acknowledge that probably many of the good things that I see about this movie is nostalgia and I think I'm looking back at it with a somewhat negative eye from the point of view as a 20 something year old that's revisiting this series for a bit of nostalgia and a bit of fun but I don't know I can't deny that it's a good time and at the end of the day it's the first like kind of encounter with the hex girls mm -hmm. it's not a stupid movie there's stupid things that happen in it but I, I would definitely watch it again. So for that reason, I definitely would smash The Witch's Ghost. I mean, not smash The Witch's Ghost, but God. I'd definitely smash this movie. But uh, I think it's it's it would be a weaker smash than, than, you know, like top tier. So, Millie, would you smash or pass this movie? I will say it's, the, it's <laughs> completely the lower end of smash. I think... If it weren't for the Hex Girls first appearance and that really iconic song in that appearance, then I think I would perhaps revise this. It's certainly almost middle ground for me personally. But like I said, the Hex Girls definitely has to tip it over into the Smash category. So lastly, Smash, what would you say? Is The Witch's Ghost a Smash or Pass for you? Oh, unfortunately... <laughs> I just have never loved this one, even... I mean, I do love the Hex Girls, and I acknowledge that, yet, this movie gave us the Hex Girls and has brought them in for, you know, the rest of the years and whatever. But I'm going to pass this one. I just can't, like... I, I mean, it's one I'll watch if someone else wants to watch it, but it is not one that I regularly pull out to watch on my own. You know, I think... I watched it last year... Um, once, because I was, like, watching every Scooby movie up until the release of Scoob. Um, but before that, I don't think I'd watch this in a good, like, at least six or so years. So I just, I don't know. I don't, something about this one is just very weak to me. I can acknowledge its strengths, because there are some highlights in this movie, but they're just not enough for me to smash it. Okay, I, I respect that decision. Mm. Like, I think we both found that it was certainly, definitely a lot lower on the Smash category than perhaps the first one that we reviewed, which was Zombie Island. So guys, I think that concludes for this week. Thank you so much to everybody that's been listening. Thank you so much again to Smash for appearing in this episode. Uh, we really enjoy recording these with you and hearing all your theories. So for anyone wanting to kind of almost partaking these themselves um you know we try and be as active in the premieres as possible so what we we're thinking is we're gonna let you know that next the next kind of movie is gonna be the alien invasion Woo! invader sorry and so if you want to watch that beforehand then you can partake in the comment section and so yeah this has been another episode of smash or pass yeah and 
Honestly, ooh, I don't want to spoil too much, but I am I am hyped for the Alien Invaders. Like, oh, I am hyped. Oh, I me am too. Hyped. I'm ready so for I... it. Okay, confession. I actually don't think I've seen it. So no. this is going to be interesting. Oh. I'm going to be doing, I think, my first no, watch I'm... of this one this week. Oh my god, it is it is groovy. It is groovy. But... You're in for a treat. Yes, I don't. You want to know something? Oh. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. I. Okay, so I have two things. First of all, to end the witch's ghost conversation, <sighs> um, because you know we see at the end of the movie the gang are up on stage with the hex scrolls jamming out and whatever. Um, that is a reference to what Scooby Doo was originally going to be because it was gonna. First be called Who's Sis is Scared and then Mystery 5. And they were going to be a rock band who <laughs> solved mysteries in between uh, gig. Oh, wow. And so that's just kind of a fun little Easter egg at the end of this movie. Oh, yeah, there's a reference But to what else I was going to say. Um, last year, I believe it was, I finally showed my girlfriend, Mariah, um, Alien Invaders. So, Millie, if you haven't seen this one, let me just tell you, this movie's reveal is not what you think it is. And <laughs> even my girlfriend was like, what? I did not see that coming at all. So, I hope you enjoy it. I think you're in for a treat. I definitely think it's better than Witch's Ghost. Okay, hey, so I think the next episode is certainly going to be very interesting then. So, two very much predetermined loves for this movie and... I'm going to see what I think too. So guys, please make sure that you come back next week for that video. Anything else you want to add, JB? I guess just, you know, for the purposes of people watching this on the channel, um, Smash's links will be in the description down below. Smash does awesome things on the channel. There's so many cool vlogs, more Scooby content. Like, I'm, I'm addicted to Smash's channel, I think it's fair to say. So please do go into the description and find that because... It is awesome. So to everyone listening, thank you so much for listening to this installment of Smash or Pass. Please make sure to tune in next time. So yeah, please like, comment and subscribe to JB, Millie and Smash.